Sure. Wow, look at the diehard still there. It's getting cold and it might rain. It's snowing at our house already, we just found out. I hope we can make it up to Summit. <laughs> anyway, my name is Ted Thompson Andrak. Thanks for coming to our last demo. Uh, our next show after this will be in Mission Viejo. We'll be doing the Irish Fair down there. And uh, then after that, the next Scots one will be the Scots Fest in uh, Costa Mesa games. So, and the Ventura games too. So. We do most of them in this area. It's a lot of fun showing off our dogs. We're uh, SoCal Herding. We're a training facility located in the high desert, up in the hills of Palmdale. And we take folks just like yourselves that have these herding or working breed dogs um, that need an outlet. When we breed these dogs to work, we're breeding them to work. They're not happy laying on the couch. Um, they don't want to just eat chips and get fat and watch television. They want to work. They were bred to go out and do a job. And for these dogs, <clears throat> their job is sheep work. Start to squirm a little bit, maybe back away. It just makes people uncomfortable to be stared at. <coughs> Excuse me. Predator, prey animals are the same way. They don't like it when a wolf or a coyote, a predator type thing starts creeping up and staring at them like that. So what happens with that stare it makes them more alert and makes them more prone to want to start to leave without and so for the dogs that's great because it doesn't mean the dog has to exert itself or get close to it or maybe even go up and try to nip one to get it to move or that type of thing they'll start to move just on that eye as the dog is creeping closer to them so as far as we know they're the only breed that has done that there's about 30 different herding breeds in the american kennel club and uh, the, her the Border Collie is the only one that we know of with that eye. All the other breeds are called loose eye breeds, which means they go to work by their size, their presence. You know, they go in and they just get close, and basically they're saying, I'm the predator, you better move, type of thing. Or the Border Collie is the more finesseful. The Border Collie is the smoothest, the, the uh, most exact dog that we compete with. When the money's on the line, <clears throat> most of these other breeders that I know that breed other breeds, they all have the Border Collies in their backyard that they secretly train at home with. When the money's on the line, they always show up with those dogs, not their other ones. So these are the Lamborghinis of the herding world. They are the number one herding dog. There is none that's better. It's as simple as that. So real quick, let me explain how it works. <clears throat> this is a prey predator drive. The sheep's instinct, being a prey animal, is to move away from anything unlike itself. The predator in this thing, his case, is his instinct is to go to a prey animal. The one thing that we know that prey animals will move 180 degrees away from something coming to them that they don't like, just like we would. If something was coming towards us, we would watch it for a while, but as it got closer to us, we would all have a point in mind where we say, okay, if it gets to that chair over there, I think we better start backing up. We've all probably done that at some point in our life from something, okay? It's the same way with the sheep. So that's the one given that we know is somehow we can get the dogs on the other side of the sheep and then tell them to walk forward slowly. They'll take the sheep and they'll start to push the sheep right towards us, which is what we call the fetch. Anytime we're bringing sheep to us, it's called the fetch. Anytime we're pushing them away from us, it's called the drive. We'll cover that later. But So that's how we, we want to teach the dogs about that comfort zone, that flight zone that they have that won't let you get any closer. So all your movement has to be done outside of that. So if the sheep are at the Queen Mary, for instance, and I need my dog to go get them, if he runs that way at them, as soon as he hits that bubble, they're gonna start going that way. So what he has to do is he has to peel off and either go that way or that way real wide, wide enough to where what's in the middle there sees him moving but doesn't care because they're so far away. Okay, it's like the antelope. They don't care if the lion starts moving as long as he's far enough away. But when he starts getting close to them, you better believe they care. And when he hits their bubble, they're moving, okay? It's as simple as that. That's how herding works. So then it makes sense to us to start these dogs off in a round pen at home with sheep and teach them that concept of the bubble, that if you run at them, they're gonna run away. You have to go around them. So what happens is we then teach the dog to go around them, get up to the other side, and then instead of coming in at them at 20 miles an hour, we teach them to lie down and walk towards them slowly. What happens, the, the sheep or the cows will come straight towards us. The sheep will literally almost come all the way to us. 
Cows will only come so far and then they'll start to split off. Cows are driven more than fetched, meaning you get be everybody gets behind a cow and goes like this and moves it. Whereas the sheep, we can sit in one place, send the dogs, and have them, have them bring them right to us. So that's the main difference. They're, they're all prey animals. Okay, so now that you understand how that works, I'm going to bring the dog around and uh, the sheep around to, the, to you guys. And as they go by you, go ahead and touch them if you want, pet them, feel them. If you stroke them a little bit like that, you'll feel a, a, a silky substance in your hand. That's lanolin. They have that built into their coats. These, by the way, are hair sheep. They're not a wool sheep. These guys will shed out all of the, everything they have on them and then grow it back in the winter time. So right now they're in heavy coat because like I said, it's snowing in our place. So it'll be that way until about May and then they'll start to shed out and by July, end of June or July, they'll be pretty much naked if we let them go. We shear them because we do these shows and when they shed out naturally, it's like a parrot that molts. It's not very attractive, you know, so we need to keep them at least looking somewhat nice. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and bring them around, and I'm going to use my whistles for this, for Tweed. Uh, every voice command we have, we have a whistle command, so I'll show you how that works. But we start them on voices first, and when we know they know what we're saying, then we add a whistle to that. <clears throat> and we keep adding a different type of whistle, different tone of whistle, and that tells the dog what we want them to do. Verbally, they can only hear us about three or 400 yards. These whistles out easily 800 yards. And in our national finals, we put the sheep out six to eight hundred yards away. So you have to whistle to your dog. You can't, you know, yell at them. And who wants to yell anyway? Okay, let's go. Then we're going to bring out a couple of dogs to show you how we start to teach them this stuff. Oh, pay attention to the dogs' faces. And decide whether you think they're doing this because we're mean and we beat them and we make them do it. Or because they really, really love it. Okay? Oh, my God. 
Pretty cool, isn't that? Look at his face. Don't you think he likes it? I think he loves it. And for us, we kind of feel like it's playing chess with living pieces. Okay, move that over to there, that over to there, and that kind of stuff, all by him. And the fun part for us is, <coughs> excuse me, we really believe in our hearts that they love doing this. And so we think that when you let, <coughs> pardon me, when you let an animal pursue its natural, instinctual desires, it only makes sense that you're gonna have a happier, more well-adjusted animal that's probably not gonna wanna fight, dig up the flower garden, bite the neighbors, and all this other stuff, okay? So why not do what they're bred for if you're gonna get a working dog? It's as simple as that. All right, so our first little pup up is a 14-month-old pup. So the first question we're asked all the time is, we get on the phone call, we're SoCalHerdy.com, and because we're a training facility, people look us up, and they wanna bring their dogs. So the first question they ask is, hey, I got this blah, 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 what do I do with it? Well, the first thing we have to do is what we call an instinct test, because just because you go out and buy a Border Collie, an Australian Shepherd, a Belgian Malinois, a Bouvier, whatever, or any of the herding breeds, doesn't mean they're gonna go to sheep. Some of them have bred, been bred out of it because of confirmation breeding, for breeders that go ahead and they, they, um, they breed for looks only, they throw the instinct away, and if you do that long enough, you'll have a line of dogs that no longer work sheep, and unfortunately, that's happened to a few lines. So. We have to do the instinct test. We can never assume anything. Now, if the dog passes the instinct test, meaning that they want to go, what enables us to train these guys, notice no food is involved, no treats. The treat is these guys. The treat is my dog being able to go right up to these sheep and make them move and work them. Look at his face. He doesn't care about food right now. I could try to give him food. He won't take it. Outside of the arena, he'll be all over me. But once the sheep are here and he's working, that's all they care about. That's their eye, that bird dog thing they were bred with. Okay, to give them that stare. They're so focused on their sheep, they don't care about anything else. So up next is a 14-month-old pup. So at home in the round pen, we would be in, like I say, we'd be in a smaller round pen than this. And we would use sheep like this that are more dog broke, that are friendly, that aren't going to freak out and run to crash the fence and everything else. So the first thing that she's gonna do here, you see, is teach the dog about the bubble. She's gonna teach you that as long as you stay on the outside like that, these sheep will stay together and they'll stay right with the person with the stick. Because they're smart enough to learn after so many months and years of training that if they go to that person, that person's not gonna let this dog come in and bite them, okay? And some of the dogs do wanna come in and bite them. So they're smart enough to do that. And those are the kind of sheep we like to teach new people how to handle. We don't want the person to have to have sheep that are gonna split and be run all over the place. This way, as long as she does her job and keeps this dog on the outside, these sheep will be fine, they'll stay together. And by the way, Amanda started with us four years ago with a Australian cattle dog. And if you know anything about them, people ask me all the time, what's the hardest dogs to train? Corgis and cattle dogs. Because they were bred to go to the hocks of the sheep, the rear end, and bite them to get them to move. <laughs> Whereas all the other breeds here are basically headers. They go up in front of the sheep and confront them. The sheep see that, they turn and they start moving so they don't go. So that's the difference called headers and healers. So obviously when you start off with a dog that's trained to go in and bite, go in and hit that hock, and the hock is the lower part of the rear leg, to get them to move, the first thing you have to do is teach that dog you can't do that. I don't care that you were bred to do it, you're not allowed to do it. You only do it after you're trained and you have to do it because the 1,000 pound cow that you're working or the 200 pound sheep that you're working as a 40 pound dog says, I'm not moving, bite me. And you have to go up and bite them lightly, not a hard bite, we don't want to inflict any, any uh, injury to them, but bite them enough to get them to move off of that little pup. So that's what makes them move when they don't. So those are the hardest dogs, that's what she started with four years ago. And we're still struggling with that dog. I'm serious. <laughs> so she decided to go to what we call the dark side. She decided to go to the border collie. So after four years, she finally said to me, Ted, I, I want you to find me a really good border collie. Uh, and I want an import. I want one from Scotland or Ireland type of thing from some well-bred dog. And I really want to get I'm serious about this. So she got this pup a few months ago. and. 
Look, look at her, 14 months old. Look at the eye, look at the face, look at how intense she is. You, she doesn't care at all. Now that's what we don't want her to do, but see what Tweed just did? He ran over there on his own and said that she can get back over there. This is a young pup, you need to learn to stay together and help this dog. That's why I always have Tweed with me whenever we train. He's always with me to help and save, the, you know, things like that. But look at this little pup, look at the intensity, look how to me, it's so obvious that this dog wants to do this. So why not let her do it? Of course, if you're going to do it, you're probably going to have to drive at least an hour or more to come see us. There's very few of us in the Southern California area. Good girl, look at that. Oh, Mouse, what a love. All right, good job, Mouse. Thank you for the applause, they like it. But look at her face, look at her. Don't, we're we done? What? We can't be done? You know that, you remember that bumper sticker they used to have out that said, how could I be out of money? I still have checks left, you know? It's the same thing with these guys. They were looking at it going, how can I be done, Ma? The sheep are still out there. They don't think they're done. Okay, up next is my better half, Chandra, with our new pup that we got from Alistair McRae from Scotland, our 12-time United States champ. He's the international champ and he's the Scottish national champ. He's my mentor. He's who I've worked with for the last 20 years. So anytime I need a dog, I call him and he knows exactly the type of dog I need because of what I do for a living. I do this full time. So it was decided that since I had Tweed, Chandra needed a dog. Her, her present dog that she has is going on 13 years old and he's pretty much about ready to retire. And so she needs a young dog. So this dog came to us a few months ago, or about a year ago, and then sustained an injury that cost about $5,000 surgery and about eight months, seven to eight months of rehab. So he's only been on sheep now for about two to three months after rehab. So we're real pleased at what he's doing, but we're gonna show you now step two. The first part is the instinct test. So then after they pass, step one is what Amanda showed you. Start to introduce the concept of the bubble, the flight zone. Step two is introduce the concept of the bubble, but also introduce obedience. Lie down, stay there, walk up slow, things like that. So she's gonna show you how that's done here. Again, look at his face. Look at the faces of all of the dogs you're gonna see. They're all gonna look the same. They're all gonna have that intense look. They're gonna to wanna to get to their sheep. They're gonna to wanna to do this. They don't care that I'm talking on a microphone. They don't care that there's thunder and lightning. They don't care about anything. They just want to go work their sheep. So what's the best way to punish a dog like this? Beat him up, shock collar train him, and all this other stuff? Nope. We, we don't allow any of that, by the way, at our place. If you shock collar train, you can't train with us. Best way to punish a dog like this? Take him away from his sheep, which is his candy. Like when we punish kids, you don't have to beat him up. Just take away their favorite thing and make them do without it for a while. So what we do here is we'll take this dog, we'll tie him to the fence. Then we go get another dog, and we talk like this to the dog we're working now. You're my favorite, I love you. You're the best there is. And it, it works, I'm telling you. And then occasionally you look at the one you tied up and you go, and you, like that, and you turn right away. That poor dog that you tied up, if you form that partnership with your animal like we do with ours, that's, that hurts. They really go, oh, oh, he's upset with me. Oh, I gotta work better for him. When you let them go, they seem to work a little better, and you don't have to abuse them. Unfortunately, in my business, the fear method of training is very much alive. There's the old type trainer, I'll say, that wants the dog to train fast, and the best way to do that is make them so afraid of you, they'll do whatever you ask them to do. Well, but then you have a dog that every time you do something with them, they, they react like this, and they're always like that because they think they're going to get in trouble. Do ours look like that? No. We don't do that. And I tell people, if that's the way you want to train, go somewhere else. You're not going to train at our place. Look at this dog. This is a blue Merle Border Collie. This is a blue Merle Border Collie. Not a favorite color about 15 years ago. You, you hardly ever saw this in the working world. And with the Border Collie. Not only saw it with Australian Shepherds, but not Border Collies. But now in the last 10 to 15 years, they've really, really exploded in popularity. So you're starting to see quite a few of this Blue Merle uh, coloring dog. 
Yes. They come in blue merle, which is like a mixture of the blue and the gray and the white and so on. And then they come in red merle. They come in red and white. They come in blue and white. They come in sable like tweed. They come in black and white. They come in white and black. Quite a few varieties. In the working world, we don't care what they look like. We don't care what they look like in the working world. Tweed would be laughed at in the confirmation world. If I showed up at a confirmation show to me, they'd ask me, what are you doing here with that ugly dog? Well, I think he's beautiful. Well, handsome, he's a guy, but, but what's beautiful about my dog here is the way he works and the, and the work ethic that he has and what he allows me to do with our livestock. That's what makes him beautiful to me. But anyway, this is a confirmation champion, by the way. He is finished, so now he's going to focus on herding, which is really nice that his particular breeder will not breed a dog if it doesn't have the instinct, even though she breeds first for looks, but still, second, they have to have that instinct so they can still be trained like he is. If they don't, she doesn't breed them. So we say kudos to her because she's doing it right. Unfortunately, there's too many of them that knowingly will put a non-working dog to a non-working girl and say breed and produce me puppies and all those puppies that come out won't work either. And if you do that enough times down the line, you now have dogs that don't do it anymore. And we think that's a crime. If you love your breed, you should be breeding first for what they were bred for. Originally, they were bred, this dog was bred originally to, breed, to work livestock, sheep. Now you will notice a little bit of difference about him. Notice he's a little bit shorter than my dog and he's fuller coated. That's because he's what we call the AKC confirmation dogs. They were crossbred with the, the Australian Border Collie, which is a smaller, shorter dog. Our dogs are all from uh, Great Britain, either from Ireland, Scotland, or Wales and they're all bred for the hills up there so they're a little bit longer legs and they're a little bit shorter coat so there you have ash thank you tony good job ash now look at his face you can just tell they dig doing this stuff now tweed you notice every time a dog goes away and i'm still talking what does he do he always breaks off and he goes kind of around the sheep and kind of circles them he won't let them get away if we were in an open field and they started drifting away on his own, he would break off and go get them and make sure that they don't leave. Because when we do clinics in the open field, if I'm talking to a student, I gotta make sure that the sheep, after I talk, I talk a lot as you can tell, if I talk to the student and the sheep are drifting off a half a mile down the road and we don't realize it, so his job is to make sure that they don't drift too far. All right, now look at the difference in this dog. Traditional black and white, another AKC confirmation dog. Look at the intensity, look at his eye, it's the same thing. Just because he's a handsome, pretty boy, doesn't mean he's not gonna work. Again, the same breeder. This is just a young dog, he's only about 15, 16 months old. We start training him seriously. I, I put my own dogs on sheep in eight weeks, but I don't put them on the ground, I just kinda hold them and I walk towards the sheep just to see if they're gonna look at them and things like that. And then when they're old enough, I'll put them on the ground, always with Tweed or a trained dog to back them up for half an hour at a time. And in three years, you'll have a dog that's trained. Again, what Tony's showing you is that bubble. It's the most important thing we can teach these dogs is that if you run on them, they're going to run away. So you've got to stay outside of them. You've got to contain them and keep them together. Now, Tony's trying to teach this little pup that driving thing I told you about where you push the sheep away from you. And he's not understanding it yet, but he will. So now if he stalls, what we'll do is we'll relocate the sheep to where they're wanting to go somewhere. We call that the draw. So what we'll do is push him up to the other end up here. Away. There. Hold on, Tony. There. 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 Lie down, lie down, lie down, lie down you. He goes, oh, I better. Now, at the school, at home, if, we, if I was working him, training with him, if I told him to lie down and he didn't lie down, I wouldn't say it again. I would walk over there and I'd look at him and I said, I said to lie down and I would help push him down to the ground lightly. Okay, to make him know that I'm going to make you do what I tell you to do. Because commands that you're not willing to enforce mean nothing. Wait, I'm there. 
Now you see the sheep want to go this way, so now his dog will more, he'll want to stay behind him a little bit more. See what he's doing? He's not going to let him run up to his to their heads. Good job, good job. Now once they run out of room, then you send the dog, you tell him to go get them, which is what he wants to do, and then you stop him and you start to put the same thing going back the other way. All right, nice job, Tony. Good job, Moose. All right, so I'm going to finish the show here. I'm going to move the sheep up to the other end, and I'm going to show you that outrun type thing where he goes to get him, and he goes how, you see how he casts out to the sides, okay? Yep, yep. There, there he trailer but that's just to show you when you have sheep that don't want to go in the trailer that's what makes it fun it becomes a real challenge for the dog anyway that concludes our show my name is Ted Thompson on direct again with SoCal Herding if any of you want to know any information go to the website we teach classes on Sunday and even if you don't have a dog come on up and visit say hey I saw you at the Queen Mary and I kind of wanted to see how it really was you won't see anything different we don't do anything different we don't beat the dog to anything different we don't treat him any different than we do here at the show everything's the same so, okay. Anyway, thanks. A shout out to the Queen Mary again, 16th year with them. We really appreciate it. We love it here. And a shout out to the veterans out there. Thanks for your service. And my veteran Vietnam uh, brothers and sisters, welcome home. Thank you all for coming.